John brings both his historian perspective and then also uh, as superintendent of the Mississippi National Recreation, River and Recreation Area um, as part of the National Park Service here in the Twin Cities. So. Well, Mark, I'll, I'll make this quick so we, so we can get I think, some interesting questions from the conversation we've had tonight. So, 2016, we celebrate the centennial of the National Park System, and the um, mantra they're putting out is, find your park. And you've all found it because you're in a national park right now. So, thank you. So, I just want to quickly set up a context here for, you know, why this lock and dam, why these locks and dams out here, why were they needed? Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the vision they had at that time and how things changed and, and why the locks and dams got built and come back to the opportunity kind of. <laughs> So Zappio Pike comes up the Mississippi River in 1805, stops at Pike Island, spends a couple days there, negotiating with the Dakota, and then heads up to St. Anthony at the usual time in the morning, about four or five o'clock, he says. It took all day to get to St. Anthony. Well, why did it take all day to go eight and a half miles from the mouth of Minnesota to St. Anthony? He said you really could think of St. Anthony Falls as that entire eight and a half miles, like the falls of the Susquehanna or the Delaware. It was one continued rapid, aggravated, he says, by the interruption of 12 islands. So, you know, so, so this was an incredible rapids. By 1858, steamboats come and go from St. Paul a thousand times that year, and only 50 times from Minneapolis. And it's because of that incredible rapids there. And so Minneapolis looking down and seeing all that commerce, and they start this inner city rivalry where Minneapolis would want what St. Paul has. So, you know, they say, we gotta have a lock and dam. And they start, they start saying this, as early as 1852, six years before the state is even created, they're thinking lock and dam in the gorge. In fact, they paid $200, I'd like to see what the calculation of current dollars is that. They paid a Lamartine $200 just to come up to Minneapolis to prove navigation is possible. But most people look at the trip of the Fannie Harris in the 1850s. It made it to St. Anthony, it's heading down, it's got two wing runners, there's all these rapids and, and rocks in the rapids, and a wing runner gets knocked off. So it loses some steerage. The pilot panics and leaves the wheel. So this older pilot who's sitting back on the bench, he gets up and he said, I had to get up and take the wheel, because had I not, we would have been smashed to kindlings navigating the six miles of rapids they were on at that point. And they didn't tell the engineer down below, because they knew if they lost any steam, they would crash, basically. So that's the nature you know, of, of the river. So 1855, the St. Anthony Express newspaper says, we need two locks of dams in that gorge. Um, and so they, they began pushing for this. I'm gonna jump really fast up to 1930. So 1930, when Congress authorizes a nine-foot channel project, it, it, it says we will build, during the Great Depression, Locks and Dams 3 through 26, Red Ring down to just above St. Louis. Lock and Dam 1 is completed, the Florida Dam people know it, in 1917. Lock and Dam 2 at Hastings was completed in 1930. So now Minneapolis is looking downstream. And they see Lock and Dam 1 is in place, and all these other locks and dams all the way down to St. Louis are going to be in place, but there's nothing to get that commerce above St. Anthony Falls. And it wasn't in the 1930 bill. So Senator Henry Shipstead, who had been the main proponent of the bill, he works. And in 1937, gets St. Anthony Falls added, lower and upper St. Anthony added to the bill. Problem is, it's the end of the Depression. They, they can't add this to the rest of the Lancaster Channel Project. Then World War II occurs. Then they start really in the 1950s, 1956, <coughs> Lower St. Anthony's built. Upper St. Anthony has to deal with the geology here, which is really a problem. And it's, a, it's a major engineering feat to build that lock and dam and complete it. So finally, in 1963, Minneapolis is ready for the dream to be fulfilled. For over a hundred years, they've been waiting for this lock to open and make Minneapolis the commercial bookend to New Orleans. That's what they wanted to be. But it didn't happen. The dream failed. And so in, in the closing of this lock, as I said on, on Morning Edition this morning, was not, it, 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 Asian Carp didn't close the lock. They were simply a trigger that, that put into play what was already looking for some kind of trigger to happen probably anyway. It was what Jenna talked about. Two barges going through a lock at a time versus 15 barges in two segments through Lock and Dam 2. 15 barges, which is the standard total on the upper river, is 877 trucks. You know, so that's the economies of scale are huge. 
But up here, they just weren't. And they needed to get above St. Anthony because they needed space for their terminals. Um, so that, that was one of the big objectives. So the fact that the Minneapolis City Council voted to close the Upper Harbor was giving up on a dream, was giving up on a, a vision from another time. And saying, you know what? There is a new dream, and there is a new vision for this part of the river, and a new dream for Minneapolis. Minneapolis no longer cares. St. Paul, you can have that navigation. So they just don't care anymore. This, what happens is a rupture point. You know, the history it says that rupture points occur where society has done one thing one way for a long time, and then all of a sudden they got to change. And there is this rupture that occurs, this change. And that's what happened here. We finally reached the rupture point, and Asian Carp provided that. So what's the opportunity? Jacob, Representative Councilman Fry, started to get to that. But let me expand on it. It's not Minneapolis. It's not Minnesota. It's national. Um, we have a nationally significant building. We are in part of the American narrative. Across the river, we have the Pillsbury Aid Mill, part of the American story. Because this, this city led building from 1880 to 1930 in the nation, and at times the world. The, the, the Stone Arch Bridge is a national engineering landmark. These are, again, something coming from California or New York, or where was that, Virginia? So, you know, they should think of the same thing. You know, this, this is a, these are national stories. Part of, every American kid should know, or an American should know. And so, when you think about the opportunities here, there's some people who question, why is this national park here, what it's about? And I would say to those, well, let's build into it. Let's create what we create here. Let's make it national park worthy. Let's make someone say, I got to come to the Twin Cities, just because that's how they do river development. So now I want to turn it over to you for your questions.